Welcome to this infographic-based educational activity in which Dr. Nadim Riaz from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center discusses the fundamentals of immuno-oncology, including current and emerging cancer immunotherapies and biomarkers to optimize treatment selection for patients with cancer. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Deep Insight into Immuno-Oncology, a visual exploration of current and emerging pathways, targets, and biomarkers to maximize the potential of cancer immunotherapies. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash KNT860. Downloadable infographics and additional resources are also available. Hello, this is Nadim Riaz. I'm the Associate Director of Genomic Operations at Memorial Sloan Kettering and a physician scientist. Welcome to Module 1, Fundamentals of Immuno-Oncology. So we'll begin with a brief introduction of how the immune system functions in normal physiology, as well as how the immune system interacts with cancer. The immune system has evolved to help protect our body from pathogens such as viruses and bacteria. Our immune system is divided into two subsystems, the innate and adaptive components. These all derive from a common multipotent homopoietic stem cell. The innate immune system is the first responder to a wide variety of pathogens as well as danger signals from tissue and includes cells such as macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, amongst others. The adaptive immune system includes things like T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and generates a response that is more specific to a particular pathogen and can be remembered long-term via memory cells. So how do the innate and adaptive immune systems connect together? Well, on the introduction of a pathogen, it needs to be detected by some component of the innate immune system. Often this is by either dendritic cells or other professional antigen-presenting cells, which might engulf one of these abnormal cells. And components of these pathogens, such as in bacteria, the cell wall, or in viruses, certain types of double-stranded DNA, will trigger a pattern recognition receptor like a toll-like receptor or CGAS sting, amongst others. Activation of these receptors will then lead to the generation of cytokines, which will recruit the adaptive immune system to investigate what's occurring and subsequently lead to an appropriate adaptive response. So how does the adaptive immune system actually generate a more specific response for a pathogen? So if we take T-cells as an example, each T-cell has a unique T-cell receptor, which is responsible for recognizing an antigen. That antigen could be a pathogen from a virus or bacteria, or that antigen could be something from cancer. Although we only have 20,000 genes in the genome, we have over 10 to the 20th possible T-cell receptors. And this diversity is actually generated by a process of VDJ recombination. So there's a locus in the genome that consists of segments that get rearranged to produce a wide variety of unique T-cell receptors. This includes a V-segment, a diversity segment, and a J-segment. The D-segment includes the generation of random sequences, which lead to an enormous number of possible recognition motifs for our T-cell repertoire. Now, of course, an important role of the immune system besides recognizing an abnormal pathogen or recognizing a cancer is going to be preventing autoimmunity. So this random generation of T-cell receptors is at risk of leading to autoimmunity. And so T-cells undergo their primary education in the thymus, where they undergo a process of positive selection and negative selection. T-cells are first selected for T-cell receptors that are able to bind to MHC class 1 to make sure that these T-cells have some functionality. T-cells that are not able to do this undergo apoptosis. And then T-cells that too strongly recognize a self-antigen are clonally deleted and also undergo cell death. This leaves us with T-cells that recognize antigens that are not present in self and can help us identify bacteria and other pathogens. So how does the immune system play a role in cancer? We often thought of cancer as a genetic disease which involved alterations in important cellular processes such as invasion and metastasis, evading growth suppressors, dysregulating a proliferative signaling, and dysregulating cell death. However, in the past decade or two, we've learned through preclinical investigations that tumors also require the ability to evade immune destruction, as well as there's a counter side of the immune system, which can actually facilitate oncogenesis. 
Now, we've known for a long time that the immune system is actually prognostic in cancers. The increased number of CD8 T cells in malignancy was prognostic of outcome, whether or not patients received immunotherapy. So if patients just received surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, patients with a higher number of CD8 T cells had an improved outcome, whereas those with higher numbers of macrophages or myelotrived cells tended to have a worse outcome. However, it wasn't clear if this was just a correlative observation or something that might be causatively exploited therapeutically. We had a hint, though, that there was a causative relationship for this observation from evidence from transplant patients. Patients who undergo organ transplant, as everyone is aware, receive uh, significant amounts of treatment to dampen their adaptive immune system. And although initially it was thought that the suppression of the adaptive immune system led to just virally related cancers, more careful epidemiologic studies have demonstrated that dampening the adaptive immune system actually increases the frequency of a wide variety of cancers, including lung cancer, colorectal cancer, skin cancer, melanoma, amongst others, suggesting that T cells play an important role in immune surveillance and preventing the outbreak of malignancy. Importantly, further refinement of our histologic understanding of cancers has demonstrated that T cells are not just randomly distributed in tumors, or however characterized into subtypes. Some tumors have wide infiltration of T cells. Other tumors have T cells that are excluded from the tumor, suggesting the tumor is actively evading the immune system. And then, of course, some tumors have very sporadic immune infiltrates, suggesting the immune system hasn't been fully triggered by the cancer, further suggesting an important role of the adaptive immune system in malignancy. So with that introduction, we'll begin with a brief overview of the innate immune response to tumors. These cells play an important role in also facilitating the therapeutic benefit of many of the treatments we use in clinic today. So NK cells, of course, play an important role in FC-mediated antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity that happens from antibodies that we use, such as cetuximab. These tumor-infiltrating innate immune cells that are the first responders will also wind up secreting cytokines that can alter the chemokine milieu of a tumor and lead to either a tumor-promoting microenvironment or a microenvironment that will facilitate an adaptive immune response. Going into a little more detail about the natural killer cells, these are a group of innate immune cells that show spontaneous cytotoxic activity against cells under stress, such as tumor cells and virus-infected cells. After activation, NK cells have an effector immune response via secretion of several cytokines, such as interferon gamma, tumor necrosis factor alpha, GMCSF, and chemokines that can modulate the function of the innate and adaptive immune cells. Importantly, NK cells play an important role in ensuring that all normal cells are expressing the human leukocyte antigen and are able to undergo a process of immune surveillance. Cancers that downregulate human leukocyte antigen may be susceptible to NK cell-based treatments. Although, as we had previously discussed, NK cells are considered part of the innate immune system, it's clear that some subsets have memory-like features that may contribute to an anti-tumor response. Excitingly, there are many NK cell-based cancer immunotherapies on the horizon, including NK cells and cancer immunosurveillance, adoptive NK cell therapies, cytokine therapies, chimeric antigen receptor NK cell-based therapies, and then, of course, monoclonal antibody therapies that target a variety of NK cell checkpoints. Another important component of the innate immune system is these pattern recognition sensors, which first trigger the immune system to know that something abnormal is occurring in the microenvironment of a tissue. One of the most important of these sensors for cancer is the cytosolic DNA sensing pathway called CGAS sting. Historically, this pathway was thought to detect double-stranded DNA from viruses that might be in the cytosol. However, it's become clear that other sources of double-stranded DNA can trigger this pathway as well. They include things like DNA from the mitochondria or DNA caused by genomic instability from cancers. And so as we know, cancers are quite genomically unstable. They often generate double-stranded DNA that leaks from the nucleus to the cytosol that may be activating this pathway. Activation of this pathway and the generation of interferons in an acute setting is thought to facilitate an adaptive immune response. However, this pathway has another face, which is that chronic CGAS sting signaling may actually facilitate the activation of non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling and actually facilitate metastasis and invasion. Because of these two phases of this pathway, this pathway is an active area of investigation for therapeutic manipulation in clinical trials at the moment. And this appears to be one of the main pathways by which the innate immune system can identify that there is an abnormal growth occurring.
although the immune system plays an important role in suppressing cancers, if an abnormal inflammatory response occurs, it can actually, on the other hand, promote malignancy. And so we've known for quite a while that tumor-promoting inflammation occurs in human tumors. During a normal inflammatory response by the innate and adaptive immune system, immune cells carry out designated tasks of engulfing or destroying foreign invaders. However, within a complex tumor microenvironment, the same infection-fighting immune cells can be reprogrammed by cancer cells. And as a result, instead of destroying the transformed cells, these anti-tumor immune cells are subverted into tumor-promoting immune cells that can secrete pro-survival, pro-migration, and anti-detection factors that allow for growth and metastasis. How does the adaptive immune system respond to tumors? So I think in a very simplified manner, T cells are the main components of the adaptive immune system that can recognize a cancer as foreign. And when they recognize a cancer as foreign, they can unleash a cytotoxic response that can lead to tumor cell death. The best way of understanding this is the cancer immunity cycle, initially described by Chen and Melman. If we think of tumors in the microenvironment, Cancer cells occasionally undergo spontaneous cell death, which leads to the release of tumor antigens picked up by professional antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells. These dendritic cells traffic to the lymph nodes, and in the lymph nodes, these dendritic cells present antigens to T cells and lead to T cell priming and activation. Activated cytotoxic T cells from the lymph node then travel via blood vessels back to the tumor microenvironment. And in the tumor microenvironment, these activated T cells look for the tumor antigens in cancer cells. And when they recognize a tumor antigen in a cancer cell, they unleash a cytotoxic response on that cancer cell, killing that cancer cell. So one fundamental step in this cancer immune cycle is the recognition of cancer cells by T cells. And this process occurs by an important pathway called the HLA antigen presentation pathway. HLA class 1 molecules are presented on all cells of our body. These molecules present random proteins on the cell surface. In cancers, the goal of this pathway is to identify abnormally expressed or perhaps mutated proteins on the cell surface that can be recognized by a T cell as a foreign. And so this HLA T cell receptor recognition is considered as signal one to activate a T cell. Of course, T cells need multiple signals for activation. So the first step is this MHC complex. And then, of course, T cells also need a co-activation stimulus. Uh, This is often a CD28-based stimulation, and this is often considered signal two. T cells that don't have this T cell recognition step, i.e. there is no antigen that the T cell recognizes in the cell as foreign, will have no response. If there is that first signal, but there is no co-activation signal, then T cells will undergo energy. Now, there are multiple classes of antigens that could facilitate the immune system recognizing a cancer as foreign. One of the most interesting types of these antigens are neoantigens. These are antigens that are derived from mutations. As we all know, cancer is a genetic disease caused by a number of mutations, and these mutations lead to a novel proteins, which can then be presented on the cell surface of tumors to the immune system for the immune system to recognize an abnormality. These mutated peptides are not present in normal cells. Now, what's intrigued many with uh, neoantigens is there's been described a very clear relationship between the number of mutations in a tumor and the objective response rate to checkpoint blockade in clinic. And so if these mutated antigens are important, one would speculate that tumors with more mutations should be more likely to respond to checkpoint blockade. And in fact, we do see in clinic that tumors that on average have a higher number of somatic mutations are more likely to respond. So T cells, which are one of the prime mediators of the adaptive immune response, have been an active area of investigation for how to facilitate an immune response in human tumors. And there are a wide variety of activating receptors and inhibitory receptors that can be pharmacologically targeted. And a wide variety of these are in clinical investigation today. So we can either try and further activate T cells by facilitating that activation, or we can try and remove inhibitory signals from T cells to try and promote activation. So how can we target these pathways to trigger cancer immunity? Well, 
going through the cancer immunity cycle, we see there are many points of entrance to try and facilitate an immune response. And depending on whether we're thinking about trying to facilitate antigen presentation, we can think about mechanisms of trying to trigger immunogenic cell death to release antigens. We can think about mechanisms of facilitating antigen recognition. We can think about mechanisms of trying to facilitate the priming step in the lymph node. We can think about mechanisms to facilitate trafficking T cells to the tumor. And then we can think about mechanisms of improving recognition of cancer by T cells. So there are a number of different ways of activating the immune system. And which part in the cycle you want to adjust alters how you think about activating the immune system for that specific step. I think more broadly, we can think of this sort of in three big categories. We can think about parts of the immune system where the immune system needs to be able to recognize the cancer and get the immune system turned on. And that often we can think about things like vaccines or adoptive T-cell therapy or CAR-Ts or TILs, which facilitate turning on the immune system or having the immune system recognize the cancer as foreign. We can also think about things that turn the gas on on the immune system. Those include things like cytokines, toll receptor agonists, and other agonist antibodies. And then, of course, the approach that's had the most success today in clinic is removing the break on the immune system, so the checkpoint blockade, PD-1 and PDL one Right. So let's now, with that brief understanding of how T-cells work in cancer, look at how the fundamental checkpoints that are used in clinic today function. This animation illustrates how some of the immunotherapy agents called immune checkpoint inhibitors work in the treatment of cancer. Cancer cells are able to evade recognition by the immune system, which allows them to survive. Cancer cells express PDL1, which binds to PD1 on T cells to turn off anti tumor responses. This is called an immune checkpoint. Immunotherapy prevents cancer cells from inhibiting T cell attack. Anti PD1 antibody therapies block the immune checkpoint, allowing the immune system to recognize cancer cells. Anti PDL1 antibody therapies can also be used to block this negative interaction. Immunotherapy allows the immune system to recognize cancer cells, leading to anti tumor responses and cancer cell death. Other immune checkpoint inhibitors act outside the tumor microenvironment, in the lymph nodes. Antigens shed from dying or replicating cancer cells are recognized by antigen-presenting cells in the circulation and taken to the central lymphatic system. In the lymph node, antigen-presenting cells interact with T cells via CD80 and CD86 ligands and CTLA-4 receptors on T cells. CTLA-4 is the major negative regulator of T cells which outcompete stimulatory CD28 by binding CD80 or CD86 receptors on antigen-presenting cells with higher affinity to turn off anti-tumor responses. This is another immune checkpoint. Blocking CTLA-4 negative regulation with an immune checkpoint inhibitor frees CD80 or CD86 ligands to bind CD28, leading to T cell activation. Active T cells can then move through the circulation, infiltrate the tumor microenvironment, and initiate anti-tumor responses to kill cancer cells. So the primary checkpoint access used in clinic today is the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitory checkpoint. This checkpoint plays an important role in peripheral immune tolerance. So earlier in this module, we discussed central tolerance to try and prevent autoimmunity. PD-1 and PD-L1 play a role in the periphery to try and prevent autoimmunity from occurring. When a naive T cell is activated, it upregulates PD-1. And if a T cell is able to clear the antigen, PD-1 is downregulated, and that T cell turns into a memory cell. However, if the adaptive immune response is not able to clear the pathogen or the cancer, a T cell will become exhausted and upregulate PD-1 further. This PD-1, PD-L1 access plays an important role in acute infection, cancer, and autoimmunity. In cancers, this pathway is often hijacked by malignant cells to prevent an adaptive immune response from occurring in tumors. And so tumor cells often will upregulate PDL1 to inhibit T cell activation. 
on a molecular basis, we had briefly talked about how the MHC TCR complex or signal one is the first step in T cell activation and that we then needed a co-activation signal or signal two, which is based on CD28 binding to one of its ligands, such as CD80. And downstream, activation of the T cell receptor and this signal two lead to transcription factors being activated, such as NFAT. Now, PD1 and PDL1 are actually inhibitory to both TCR and CD28 signaling. So, PD1 signaling will dampen downstream effects of TCR signaling as well as dampen downstream effects of CD28 signaling, inhibiting T cell activation, decreasing T cell proliferation, and decreasing the likelihood a T cell will survive. This PD1 PDL1 interaction can occur either between a T cell and a tumor cell or a T cell and an antigen presenting cell. So it's not just limited to the T cell tumor cell interface, although a majority of the activity of PD1 is thought to occur at the T cell tumor cell interface. So immune checkpoint inhibitors primarily function by relieving this T cell inhibitory signal. The other checkpoint that has been clinically approved is CTLA4. And in clinic, drugs that target this checkpoint include drugs like ipilimumab. This checkpoint primarily functions at the T cell antigen presenting cell interface and is thought to inhibit T cell priming. CTLA4 can bind to CD80 or CD86 and function as a negative regulator of T cell priming. The use of CTLA4 will inhibit this negative checkpoint and facilitate T cell activation and subsequently facilitate T cell priming and the generation eventually of cytotoxic T cells that can target tumors. Now, importantly, this effect occurs in lymph nodes and not in the tumor microenvironment. Now, how about the tumor microenvironment and Tregs and how they influence cancer immunity? Non-infiltrated tumors often have poor chemokine expression, often have significant amount of extracellular matrix that inhibits migration of immune cells into the tumor. T-cell infiltrated tumors, on the other hand, will often have activation of a wide variety of cytokines that can wind up over the long term resulting in a suppressive microenvironment with the expression of a wide variety of chemokines that dampen T-cell activation. Further, abnormalities in the microenvironment can lead to metabolic dysregulation, which can deactivate T cells. Welcome back to our educational infographic activity on immune oncology. We'll now begin Module 2, Cancer Immunotherapy and Biomarkers, the Current Landscape. We'll begin by looking at immune checkpoint inhibitors. Immune checkpoint inhibitors have been approved in multiple indications. There are three main classes of drugs, those that target PD-1 directly, that includes nivolumab and pembrolizumab, those that target PD-L1, that includes atezolizumab, avilumab, and dervilumab, and those that target a different checkpoint axis, CTLA-4, which includes ipilimumab. And the development of these drugs in the clinical setting has proceeded in a typical manner for new drug development in cancer. These were first tested in the metastatic and relapse setting and have shown remarkable activity in a wide variety of malignancies. And they've subsequently moved into the metastatic first-line setting where their standard of care in that setting, again, in a wide variety of malignancies. And today we're investigating how to use these agents in the most appropriate manner in locally advanced and earlier stage disease. We'll now look at the immune checkpoint inhibitor landscape and specifically selected monotherapy indications. PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors have been approved in multiple cancer subtypes. These are probably one of the broadest active class of agents since the advent of cytotoxic chemotherapy. The other checkpoint actively used in clinic is CTLA-4 inhibitors, which have been approved in melanoma. Beyond their broad activity, the other exciting thing about anti-PD-1 agents in particular is that their responses appear to be quite durable. You see here five-year overall survival from Keynote 001 for patients who had either melanoma or non-small cell lung cancer. Results from looking at patients with melanoma, renal cell cancer, and non-small cell lung cancer who received nivolumab show similar results. Patients with melanoma and kidney cancer having five-year survivals of just under 40%, and those with non-small cell lung cancer having five-year survival just under 
And so we see for previously incurable diseases that there are patients with metastatic cancers living out past five years, suggesting that this response is durable and may be curative in a subset of patients. With their success in the metastatic setting, these have been now starting to be investigated in the locally advanced setting. The Pacific study looked at the use of dravilumab after standard of care chemo radiotherapy in locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer. You can see the results for progression-free survival demonstrating a significant improvement for patients who received dravilumab instead of placebo. And again, we see almost 10% improvement in overall survival at the two-year time point, suggesting a big benefit of dravilumab in the earlier setting in lung cancer. We've seen similar results in melanoma. Looking at results for Checkmate 238, we see a 10% improvement in relapse-free survival at two years with the use of nivolumab in the adjuvant setting in locally advanced melanomas. Similar results were obtained in Keynote 054, looking at pembrolizumab in adjuvant setting, showing a 20% improvement in relapse-free survival. And so we've seen that these checkpoint inhibitors are not only active in metastatic setting, but are now showing signs of activity in locally advanced and earlier disease stage settings. Moving forward, we'll briefly examine a variety of combination strategies for PD-1 and pd one inhibitors. There are four main categories of combinatorial strategies that have been approved in clinic. Those include the combination of a PD-1 inhibitor and a CTLA-4 inhibitor. People have investigated PD-1 and PD-L1 access drugs with chemotherapy. And then, of course, there has been recent interest in looking at combining the PD-1 access with VEGF inhibition. So looking at IO-IO combinations, Checkmate 067 examined the role of nivolumab and ipilimumab combined versus monotherapy with ipilimumab or monotherapy with nivolumab. Numerically, this showed that the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab had the highest survival. According to the updated five-year results from the Checkmate 067 trial, both nivolumab alone or in combination with ipilimumab provided significant improvements in overall survival and progression-free survival over ipilimumab alone in patients with advanced treatment-naive melanoma. But the combination yielded the most impressive outcomes, with 52% of patients still alive at five years. The median overall survival was not yet reached for nivolumab plus ipilimumab, representing the only treatment for metastatic melanoma for which median survival exceeded 60 months. And in Checkmate 227, we again saw that the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab improved survival compared to patients who received chemotherapy. The results were from Part 1 of the Checkmate 227 trial, in which nivolumab plus ipilimumab met the endpoint of overall survival, demonstrating superior benefit versus chemotherapy in patients whose tumors express PD-L1 greater than or equal to 1%. Additionally, in an exploratory analysis, results showed improved overall survival for patients treated with the combination with PD-L1 less than 1%. This combination represents a new chemotherapy-free, first-line option for patients with advanced, non-small cell lung cancer. In addition to the approval of nivolumab plus ipilimumab for first-line treatment of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer expressing PD-L1 greater than or equal to 1% as determined by an FDA-approved test and without EGFR or ALK genomic tumor aberrations based on Checkmate 227, The combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab in two cycles of platinum doublet chemotherapy was also FDA-approved. This indication is for first-line treatment of metastatic or recurrent non-small cell lung cancer with no EGFR or ALK genomic tumor aberrations, regardless of PD-L1 expression status, and is based on results from the Checkmate 9LA trial. The combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab is FDA-approved for intermediate or poor risk previously untreated advanced renal cell carcinoma. The approval was based on the results of the Checkmate 214 trial. Furthermore, this IO-IO combination was recently FDA approved for hepatocellular carcinoma in patients who have been previously treated with serafinib. Approval for this indication was based on the overall response rate and duration of response seen in the combination cohort of the Phase 1-2 Checkmate 040 trial. So moving forward to look at the other two prominent combinations that are being investigated in clinic, which include IO plus chemotherapy or IO plus anti-VEGF agents. 
So IO plus chemotherapy has been examined in Keynote 189 and Keynote 407, both studies looking at metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and both studies demonstrating a significant improvement to pembrolizumab combined with chemotherapy compared to placebo or chemotherapy alone. And we see in both a significant improvement in overall survival with the addition of pembrolizumab to chemotherapy. In Passion 130, investigated the use of atezolizumab in triple negative breast cancer and again showed an improvement in overall survival in PDL1 positive patients compared with chemotherapy alone in the metastatic triple negative breast cancer setting. Anti PD1 agents have also been combined with VEGF directed therapies. And so, Keynote 0426 examined pembrolizumab with a small molecule TKI exitinib, which hits multiple VEGF targets, and demonstrated that the pembrolizumab exitinib combination had a survival advantage. In Power 150, combined PDL1 inhibitor with chemotherapy and VEGF inhibitor, and show that the combination of chemotherapy, VEGF inhibition, and PDL1 inhibition was superior to VEGF inhibition and chemotherapy alone, suggesting that there may be synergy between combining PDL1 based therapies with chemotherapy and an anti VEGF directed treatment. By increasing the activity of the immune system, immune checkpoint blockade can also cause inflammatory side effects, which are often termed immune-related adverse effects, or IRAEs. Let's look at a brief animation explaining IRAEs. This animation illustrates the unique spectrum of immune-related adverse effects associated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Immunotherapy, such as checkpoint inhibition, enhances the ability of the immune system to recognize cancer cells, leading to the anti-tumor responses and cancer cell death. The enhanced immune activity with immunotherapy is associated with autoimmune responses known as immune-related adverse effects. Immune-related adverse effects can affect a range of organ systems including the nervous system, cardiovascular, pulmonary, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, ocular, endocrine, dermatologic, hematologic, and renal systems. It is important that patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals remain vigilant during and after immunotherapy to ensure timely recognition and management of immune-related adverse effects so that patients derive maximum benefit from these therapies. So moving forward, what are our current immunotherapy biomarkers? So let's start with PDL1 expression, perhaps the most important biomarker for immunotherapy. So importantly, PDL1 can be expressed on either tumor cells or immune cells. PDL1 expression is often an adaptive mechanism as CDA T cells infiltrate into tumors and cytokines are released. This can facilitate the expression of PDL1 on tumors. Importantly, there are multiple mechanisms of testing for PDL1 in the tumor microenvironment. So each checkpoint inhibitor has its own assay to assess PDL1 staining. Here we see a table of the four most commonly used checkpoint inhibitors, including the volumab, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, and dervilumab. And they all have a unique IHC based assay with a unique monoclonal antibody that tests for PDL1 staining. In some indications, PDL1 staining is complementary, whereas in other indications, PDL1 staining is actually a companion diagnostic required for treatment. In some indications, we only are concerned about PDL1 staining on tumor cells specifically. And in other indications, we care about PDL1 staining on both tumor cells and immune cells. Importantly, the cut points used are also quite different between the different indications and the different drugs. So, in summary, a PDL1 expression is an FDA approved biomarker for pembrolizumab in non small cell lung cancer, urothelial cancer, gastric cancer, cervical cancer, head and neck cancer, and esophageal cancer. PDL1 staining is also approved for guiding the tezolizumab treatment in triple negative breast cancers and urothelial malignancies. Based on the most recent FDA approvals, PDL1 expression testing is also required to guide treatment decisions for the use of atezolizumab monotherapy, as well as the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab in the first line setting of non small cell lung cancer. Here we see data for outcomes in Keynote 042 by PDL1 level. This is a population of non small cell lung cancers comparing patients who receive pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy. And we can see in patients with PDL1 staining over 50%, there's a significant improvement in overall survival for patients who received pembrolizumab. 
with patients with PDL1 standing between 1 and 49%, there appears to be no difference between the pembrolizumab and chemotherapy arms in overall survival. We see very similar results in Keynote 189, which looked at pembrolizumab combined with chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. And we see again that as the fraction of tumor cells that have higher PDL1 staining increases, the benefit of adding pembrolizumab further increases. Similarly, in Impassion 130, which looked at the use of atezolizumab to chemotherapy and with metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we see that in the PDL1 positive patient population, there's an improvement in overall survival, which does not exist in the overall population. All right, moving on to the next FDA approved biomarker, which is microsatellite instability. So microsatellite instability is a deficiency of the MMR DNA repair pathway. There's a hereditary syndrome called Lynch syndrome, which results in hereditary defect in one of these genes, which predisposes patients to colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer. It can also occur sporadically due to silencing of MLH1 due to promoter methylation. There are multiple strategies to test for this routinely in clinic, including immunohistochemistry for components of the mismatch repair complex, including MLH1, PMS2, MSH2, and MSH6 or microsatellite instability testing by PCR looking at five different loci. You can also use next-generation sequencing to identify tumors that are microsatellite unstable. Luis Diaz and other investigators showed that patients with mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancers had improved overall survival after receiving anti-PD-1 therapies, and they subsequently demonstrated that this was a pan-cancer phenotype, so regardless of histology, tumors that were mismatch repair deficient had a significantly high response rate to anti-PD-1 treatments. So microsatellite instability is an FDA-approved biomarker for pembrolizumab in solid tumors of any histology and colorectal cancer for the use of nivolumab and nivolumab plus ipilimumab in metastatic colorectal cancers that are microsatellite unstable. Moving forward with our next current immunotherapy biomarker, tumor mutational burden. So tumor mutational burden, as we've discussed in the prior module, is considered a biomarker for immunotherapy because it may indicate how foreign a cancer appears to the immune system. So these mutations that are generated, and often they're passenger mutations, result in changes in proteins, which are subsequently expressed or presented on the cell surface by MHC class 1, and then can be recognized by a T cell as foreign. Initial data demonstrating that tumor mutational burden was associated with outcomes originated from Memorial Sloan Kettering looking in patients with melanoma who received anti-CTLA-4 therapy, and this study demonstrated that patients who had a long-term benefit to anti-CTLA-4 therapy had a higher overall number of coding mutations, and that the survival of patients with over 100 mutations in their exome was markedly improved compared to patients who had less than 100 mutations in their exome. This was similarly reproduced in a cohort of patients with non-small cell lung cancer, again demonstrating improved rates of patients with durable clinical benefit who had higher TMB compared to those with lower TMB. Interestingly, many patients with higher TMB had mutations in DNA repair genes. And importantly, as we've seen previously, the response rates in phase one to two studies across cancer types to anti-PD-1 therapies appears to be directly proportional to the median number of somatic coding mutations in a tumor type. So cutaneous squamous cell cancers have one of the highest tumor mutational burdens due to their marked exposure to UV light, have one of the highest response rates to anti-PD-1 therapies, whereas pancreatic cancers, which have a relatively lower TMB, have a lower rate of response in the phase one study. Studies. Tumor mutational burden is a continuous variable, and obtaining a cutoff can be challenging. A wide variety of cutoffs have been proposed. Data from Checkmate 227 suggested tumor mutational burden of around 10 may be optimal. In Checkmate 227, patients with a tumor mutational burden greater than 10 appear to have a higher progression free survival when they receive nivolumab and ipilimumab compared to chemotherapy. However, the results of the overall survival analysis did not suggest that this TMB cutoff was necessarily predictive for benefit. MYSTIC was a study of dervilumab plus tremolimumab versus chemotherapy versus dervilumab alone in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. 
And in this study, the authors investigated the use of a blood-based assessment of tumor mutational burden and its association with outcomes. They used a slightly higher cut point than what was previously discussed, cut point of 16, and they identified that a blood-based TMB greater than 16 was associated with benefit for dervilumab and tremolimumab compared to chemotherapy in the high TMB group, whereas in the low TMB group, outcomes were roughly similar between the three treatment arms. Again, PDL1 expression and tumor mutation burden appear to be quite independent of each other. This is data from Sloan Kettering demonstrating the lack of any correlation between the two, suggesting they provide independent information. Now, how can we measure tumor mutational burden in the clinic? Many of the studies we've just discussed are research studies based on whole exome sequencing, which sequences 30 megabases of the coding genome. There are, of course, panel-based mechanisms that are often used to identify targeted therapies that can also give us information about tumor mutation burden. Those include things like a panel from Foundation. At Memorial Sloan Kettering, we have our own in-house panel that evaluates the coding genome called MSKCC Impact. Although all of these methods can identify tumor mutation burden, we need a conversion factor between these different methods because the depth of sequencing is different between them, the amount of the genome they sequence is different between them, and so their precise number that they're going to provide for the tumor mutation burden estimate is going to be different between different panels. And so there is ongoing effort by Friends of Cancer Research to try and harmonize tumor mutation burden between these different panels. Once these tumor mutation burden numbers harmonize between different panels, then we need to think about what is a good cut point to distinguish high and low tumors. And as we had previously discussed, identifying high and low tumors can be challenging as TMB is a continuous variable. Welcome back to Module 3 of our Educational Infographic Activity. This module will be on cancer immunotherapy and biomarkers, the next wave of progress. We'll first begin with new and emerging immunotherapies and oncology. So there are a wide variety of combination-based studies ongoing in clinic today, over 1,000 studies investigating the combination of anti-PD-1 with a broad spectrum of agents. The most popular classes of combination strategies we've previously reviewed, including the combination with chemotherapy, with other IO agents such as CTLA-4, and with drugs that target the VEGF access. However, there are innumerable other targets being looked at, both as monotherapy and in combination with anti-PD-1 therapy. Here, we'll review some of the most exciting possibilities for future treatments. We'll first look at the agents that target the microenvironment and regulatory mechanisms of the immune system. As we briefly discussed previously, uh, the VEGF access appears to be synergistically functional with the immune system. VEGF signaling is often aberrantly regulated in tumors and can lead to abnormal vasculature as well as stimulating myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Anti-VEGF therapies can subsequently normalize the vasculature and lead to enabling a recruitment of T-cells into the tumor microenvironment. And so this is currently an active area of investigation. Some combinatorial approaches with anti-angiogenic therapies have already translated to clinical success and regulatory approvals. But many other studies examining nivolumab, atezolizumab, avelumab, ipilimumab, and other checkpoint inhibitors paired with anti-VEGF monoclonal antibodies or anti-angiogenic TKIs are underway. IDO is an enzyme that metabolizes tryptophan and is present in tumor cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and B lymphocytes. And in preclinical models, inhibition of IDO leads to facilitation of an immune response. IDO itself supports an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. There was widespread enthusiasm based on preclinical data that this may be applicable in humans. Unfortunately, the clinical results were not as promising. The investigation of epicatastat, an IDO1 inhibitor to pembrolizumab, demonstrated no improvement in progression free survival. And so, this is sort of a cautionary tale of the difficulties we have in translating findings from preclinical systems and murine models of cancer immunology to humans, as in there are significant differences between the murine immune system and the human immune system. We'll move forward to cellular-based therapies. These include both adoptive T-cell-based therapies and engineered T-cell-based products. 
adoptive T-cell therapies have been pioneered by people like Steve Rosenberg at the NCI and involve extracting T-cells from individual patients' tumors, expanding them ex vivo to those T-cells that react best with tumors, and then are re-injecting them into patients. This has had promising activity in limited numbers of patients, and our current studies are underway to try and further improve on these initial results. In addition to using a patient's own T-cells expanded, we can engineer T-cells to specifically react to tumors. Uh, perhaps the most exciting example of this has been the generation of CAR T-cell therapies in liquid malignancies. And the way these treatments work is patients with relapsed refractory B-cell malignancies have T-cells extracted from them by leukapheresis. Those T-cells are then transfected by retroviral or lentiviral transduction with anti-CD19 engineered T-cell receptor. This T-cell receptor includes an antibody fragment that recognizes CD19 engineered onto a T-cell receptor that's activated when this binds to CD19. These genetically engineered T-cells are subsequently isolated and they are reinfused into a patient after a preconditioning regimen. Multiple anti-CD19 CAR T-cells have been approved for use in human patients, including the first in a relapsed or refractory ALL in pediatric or young adult patients. Subsequently, multiple anti-CD19 CAR T-cells have been approved in both adult and pediatric B-cell-based malignancies. CAR T-cells targeting other B-cell-based antigens such as BCMA are in development and appear promising for anti-tumor-based activity. The next class of therapies we'll talk about are intratumor therapies and agonists of the immune system, including oncolytic viruses and stimulating cytokines. Oncolytic viruses are viruses that are engineered to selectively replicate in tumor tissue and subsequently lead to tumor cell lysis. That tumor cell lysis is hoped to facilitate the generation of a systemic tumor immune response that can then subsequently lead to the eradication of distant cancer cells. There are a wide variety of oncolytic viruses being investigated in clinic using a wide variety of virus families. TVEC, which is perhaps one of the furthest along in clinical development, uses a herpes virus, but there are other agents being investigated today, including using other viral families. TVEC demonstrated in a phase three trial the OPTIM study improvement in overall survival over GMCSF. Studies are ongoing looking at TVEC in addition to anti-PD-1 therapy, and this may be a promising approach of trying to facilitate a recognition step for tumors in combination with anti-PD-1-based treatments. Indeed, TVEC in combination with ipilimumab has demonstrated greater efficacy than either TVEC alone or ipilimumab monotherapy, and a study has completed accrual looking at TVEC in combination with PD-1 pathway blockade. IL-2 is a well-known cytokine that stimulates T-cell pr proliferation, induces generation of cytotoxic lymphocytes, and facilitates maintenance of natural killer cells. IL-2 is also involved in the maintenance of Tregs and elimination of self-reactive T-cells. Nectar-214 is a CD122-biased agonist that's pegylated. The pegylated formulation allows for slow release of interleukin-2 after IV injection and biases the binding of the drug to the interleukin-2 receptors that are more commonly expressed on cytotoxic lymphocytes. The biased agonist is less likely to bind to IL-2 receptor alpha, which is responsible for activating Treg. And so this agent is thought to perhaps be more specific for activating CD8 T cells and not activating T regulatory cells. Phase 1 data showed promising activity in combination with anti-PD-1 therapies, and we're now awaiting Phase 3 results in multiple malignancies for whether or not this agent adds benefit on top of anti-PD-1 therapies. IL-2 is indeed an important target, and extensive clinical investigations with NKTR214, also known as bempeg aldus leucan or BEMPEG, plus nivolumab are underway. These include registrational trials in first-line metastatic melanoma, cisplatin ineligible metastatic urothelial cancer, and metastatic renal cell carcinoma, as well as in adjuvant melanoma and in muscle invasive bladder cancer. 
vaccine are another exciting area of investigation, and these include vaccines that target shared antigens or vaccines that can target neoantigens. So the idea behind a vaccine is that a vaccine is delivered to a patient against a specific antigen that's then taken up by dendritic cells in the patient, and that stimulates the generation of a T-cell response that's specific for that patient's tumor and then can lead to tumor cell eradication. One of the most exciting recent developments is the development of personalized neoantigen vaccines. This involves tumor procurement, so taking a sample of the patient's tumor and having that tumor undergo a whole exome sequencing and RNA sequencing to identify neoantigens or mutation-based antigens that are expressed in the tumor, which are determined by RNA sequencing, and that can also bind to the patient's HLA class 1 molecule, which is determined by HLA typing. Once mutations that both bind to HLA class 1 and are expressed or identified, a vaccine that's specific to a patient can be generated. There are multiple methods of generating this vaccine, whether it's through the generation of synthetic long peptides or mRNAs. And there are multiple adjuvants that can be administered with this vaccine, including poly-ICLC. Two preliminary studies demonstrated that these vaccines can successfully generate antigen-specific responses. A study by Ugar Sahin used synthetic RNA vaccines encoding 527 mer neoantigens and demonstrated responses in a handful of patients. Similar work was done at Dana-Farber using long synthetic peptides, which suggested delay of recurrence in a small number of patients. Studies looking at both synthetic long peptides and RNA vaccines are ongoing to see if these add benefit in addition to anti-PD-1 therapies. How about combining anti-PD-1 with other checkpoints or activating the innate immune system? So we briefly reviewed that there are other T-cell checkpoints that can be activated. Many of these have been investigated in preclinical systems, including molecules that can activate T-cells, including POX40, GITR, amongst others, and then, of course, other inhibitory receptors like TIM3, VISTA, and LAG3. It appears that their dysregulation in cancer is more complicated than what the preclinical model suggested. And so this is still going to require some more scientific work before these will be ready for clinical investigation. For example, relitlimab, a monoclonal antibody that targets LAG3, has been studied in combination with nivolumab in patients with melanoma who progressed during prior anti-PD-1, PD-L1 therapy and has shown some activity but further biomarker investigations are needed to determine the best way to take this and other new checkpoint-based approaches forward. This is important because research suggests that there could be a relationship between expression of targets such as LAG3, as well as their inhibition and likelihood of response. In the relatlumab studies, the response rate was higher in patients with baseline expression of LAG3. Research is ongoing to further optimize current checkpoint inhibition approaches, including CTLA-4 blockade. One such approach is focused on regulating the degree of immune activity using non-fucosylated antibodies to deplete Tregs. Another approach uses pro-antibodies that can improve CTLA-4 blockade specificity by reducing antibody binding outside the tumor microenvironment, which helps spare healthy tissues. There are a wide variety of drugs targeting the innate immune system, including, as we had discussed in Module 1, looking at Sting and C-gas, which are members of the innate immune system that wind up triggering initial interferon signaling of a tumor. They're both agonists and antagonists looking at that pathway. There are also checkpoint inhibitors targeting specifically the innate immune system, including inhibitory checkpoints on MK cells, on macrophages, and on other members of the innate immune system that are in clinical investigation. For example, T-cell immunoreceptor with immunoglobulin in ITIM domains, TIGIT, is an immune checkpoint receptor on cytotoxic, memory, and regulatory T-cells, as well as natural killer cells, which can suppress T-cell activation and promote T-cell exhaustion. Inhibition of TIGIT alone, or in combination with other checkpoint inhibitors, may increase cytotoxic T-cell proliferation and function. As another example, chemokine receptors 2 and 5 on T-cells, regulatory T-cells, monocytes, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and tumor-associated macrophages can promote trafficking of immunosuppressive cells and suppress T-cell function. Inhibition of CCR2 and 5 may decrease tumor infiltration of immunosuppressive cells and is under investigation. Preclinical and clinical studies support ongoing investigations 
of CCR2 and 5 dual antagonism. So moving forward, let's discuss novel biomarkers for immunotherapies. And so there are three classes of biomarkers, those that reflect what's happening in the microenvironment, those that reflect that what's happening in the tumor, and those that reflect parts of the host. Future work will involve refining our currently available biomarkers, as we previously discussed, improving tumor mutation burden by identifying the appropriate cut point and perhaps considering obtaining it from circulating tumor DNA. And future biomarkers will also consider how to integrate our known biomarkers together, including pdl one staining TMB, and inflammation. But of course, there are also going to be novel biomarkers, including immune cell markers and additional patient features that remain to be uncovered. The past few years have seen an explosion of the identification of immune cell markers with single cell sequencing technologies, which we'll briefly review shortly. First, we'll discuss emerging genetic biomarkers of response to the checkpoint blockade. Perhaps the most interesting of these is the human leukocyte antigen. HLA class 1, as you recall, is expressed on all cells in our body and is responsible for presenting antigens to CD8 cells. There are three main classes of HLA class 1 genes, A, B, and C. These genes are the most polymorphic genes in the human genome, meaning these genes are the most unique in the human genome. We inherit two copies of each of these genes, one from mom and one from dad, and so we have six unique copies of HLA class 1 genes. For some of us, mom and dad are a little bit more related than they should be, and so instead of inheriting six unique copies, we might inherit only five or four unique copies of HLA class 1. And so if that happens, the number of peptides we can present on our cell surface is going to decrease because the diversity of our HLA class 1 molecules has decreased. And so you might anticipate that patients who have less HLA class 1 diversity are going to have inferior response to checkpoint blockade therapy. And in fact, that is what's seen both in published exome data and in our own institutional data at Sloan Kettering. Similarly, we know tumors are quite copy number unstable. HLA, A, B, and C are all located on chromosome 6, and sometimes tumors will lose a copy of either mom or dad's chromosome 6. And when this happens, we actually see a very similar effect that patients have an inferior outcome when they have only three unique HLA class 1 molecules. So we've learned in the past few years that oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, in addition to their role on cell autonomous growth, can influence the immune microenvironment of tumors. Perhaps the best characterized is STK11 or LKB1, which is known to lead to an immune desert phenotype in non-small cell lung cancer. Similarly, MYC and beta-catenin are both also known to have immunosuppressive effects on the tumor microenvironment. So what about biomarkers in the microenvironment, such as biomarkers that indicate inflammation? Perhaps one of the best described inflammatory signatures is an interferon gamma signature, which examines the expression of a variety of cytokines and other molecules associated with activation of interferon gamma in the microenvironment. This interferon gamma signature can be measured by either RNA sequencing or by using a nanostring-based platform, and this interferon gamma signature has been previously associated with the response to anti-PD-1 therapies in phase 1 studies. An 18-gene-based gene expression program looking at interferon gamma-based genes showed an AUC of 0.75 for responders versus non-responding patients. However, beyond analyzing the expression state of a bulk tumor, we can use single-cell sequencing technologies to look at both the expression of individual cells as well as the antigen specificity of an individual cell. So as you'll recall, T-cells have an antigen specificity determined by the T-cell receptor, which undergoes VDJ recombination, and this provides a barcode on an individual T-cell. T-cells also have functional states and generally are thought to include naive T-cells, which have not been exposed to an antigen, which can either mature into effector T-cells and a memory T-cell population, or if they're chronically exposed to antigen, can differentiate into exhausted T-cells. Now, this T-cell state can be determined by the RNA in an individual T-cell. So by using single-cell RNA sequencing, we can determine a barcode of a T-cell, which determines its specificity, as well as identify what state that T-cell is in. So one of the most interesting recent studies was from Tan Schumacher, which looked at excising a tumor and investigating whether T-cells within this tumor were all reactive to the tumor itself. 
So they isolated CD8 T cells, extracted the T cell receptor, and then transfected these into T cells to identify how many of these T cells in the tumor actually responded to the tumor. And to their surprise, only one of the T cells they extracted from the tumor was actually reactive to the tumor itself. In fact, three of the T cells they extracted from the tumor were reactive to EBV as measured by interferon gamma on stimulation of extract from the tumor, suggesting that most of the T cells in the tumor are actually passengers and not able to recognize the tumor itself. This work was partially validated by work from Stanford, which used single cell sequencing to look at T cells from patients who received checkpoint blockade both pre treatment and post treatment. Single cell RNA sequencing was used to identify different T cell populations. And what was interesting was that T cells that were expanded in tumors post treatment actually were not present in tumors pre treatment when we matched samples based on that T cell barcode suggesting that many of the T cells that mediate response for checkpoint blockade are actually not pre-existing in the tumor microenvironment, but are recruited from the periphery. We ourselves have shown that T cell response in individual patients is directly proportional to the number of neoantigens lost. So the number of unique T cells that expand on therapy in patients who respond is linearly proportional to the number of neoantigens that become undetectable on therapy, suggesting that the T cells are responding to the underlying mutations in a patient's tumor. Although we've long known that CD8 T cells associate with response, single cell technologies have allowed us to identify subsequent features of these CD8 T cells that mediate response. Work from Mirha Cohen's group demonstrated that there were two subpopulations of CD8 cells present in an individual tumor. What they labeled CD8G appear to be higher in responders than in non responding melanoma patients who received checkpoint blockade therapy. And CD8G signature appeared to be primarily driven by a transcription factor called TCF7, which mediates a stem-like CD8 T cell state or a naive CD8 T cell-like state. And this was validated by IHC and immunofluorescent techniques in a separate cohort. So staining with both CD8 and TCF7 identified CD8 TCF7 positive T cells were higher in responders versus non-responders in a subsequent melanoma cohort, which has now been validated by several other groups as well, suggesting that TCF7-based CD8 T cells may be more important for mediating response than just the overall CD8 T cell population. And other features of the microenvironment may indicate an active immune response. And so although there's been significant focus on T cells, some tumors have the generation of tertiary lymphoid structures or lymphoid-like structures in the microenvironment. And so here is a melanoma patient, SOX10 highlighting the melanoma cells. And here you can see CD3 highlighting T cells and CD20 highlighting B cells, suggesting the formation of a tertiary lymphoid structure. These tertiary lymphoid structures and the presence of B cells have been associated with a superior prognosis regardless of treatment. And so these melanoma patients were treated prior to the advent of checkpoint blockade. We can see those that have high CD8 cells plus these B cells, suggesting they have the formation of these tertiary lymphoid structures have the most improved outcomes. And then lastly, there are host-related factors that can be associated with outcomes to immunotherapy. And perhaps the most interesting of these include the microbiome. The microbiome can be obtained from a stool sample and 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing to identify the populations of bacteria that are present in an individual patient. And microbiome studies have identified taxonomies that associate with patients who respond to treatment compared to patients who don't respond to treatment. To date, however, some difficulties with the microbiome studies have been that the microbiome is quite dependent on the region of the world you live in, in terms of which organisms you're exposed to. And so comparing studies from different parts of the world has been challenging as unique bacteria have been identified in different studies as being associated with the response. However, important mechanistically, fecal microbiome transplant in murine models has been significantly associated with improved response to anti-PD-1 therapy. So in summary, there are many emerging treatments in immunotherapy. There are a wide variety of combinations being explored in clinic today and a wide variety of new agents being investigated, including agents that target the innate immune system like segasting agonists, agents that target other immune checkpoints, neoantigen vaccines, and engineered T-cells. 
On the biomarker side of things, there are many new interesting avenues, including many fundamental insights we've learned from single cell sequencing of the immune microenvironment, as well as genetic and host-related biomarkers that are under active investigation. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash KNT860. This activity is supported through an educational grant from Bristol Myers Squibb. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.